Welcome to the Susan Brinder Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your best. And now, here's Susan Brinder. I'm Susan Brinder, and this is the Susan Brinder Show. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Nick Sagan. He's been a professional writer for 20 years, crafting novels, screenplays, teleplays, comic books, animation episodes, and computer games. So, you know, Nick... I'm already exhausted thinking about what you do. Uh, it's, you well, it's know, not so much. It's just a, I've, I've been fortunate I've been able to work a, a little bit in a lot of fields, and, uh, and so I've dipped a toe into a lot of ponds. Mm. So how did you get started? Well, I, uh, I, I was in Los Angeles, and my mother um, kind of fell into becoming a television writer. She didn't set out to do it, but she, uh, she wound up uh, writing TV, so she wrote for... Knott's Landing and General Hospital and a lot of sort of 8 o'clock or softer shows. And I just grew up in my teenage years watching her work on these scripts. And then every so often I would kibitz and uh, we would talk about it. And then we were, you know, co-writing things. And uh, I was not seriously looking at it as a profession. I thought writing was interesting, but it didn't, you know, I didn't know that that was what I wanted to do. And then I had this uh, epiphany where I, I saw this uh, television show that really inspired me. And, uh, I, you know, people say that there was a nimbus of light around me. And I said, I know what I want to do. Hmm. And uh, everyone said, that's great, Nick, but you're failing out of high school. Oh. And uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I took my uh, California high school proficiency exam, which is like the GED, but for uh, California. And I entered uh, community college and I made the dean's list, getting good grades for the first time in a while. And I wound up transferring to UCLA Film School, where I graduated summa cum laude. And I got into the uh, the graduate school there, but uh, before I got too far into it, the head of the writing program at UCLA had uh, asked me if I minded if he gave my script to an agent. And uh, I didn't mind. And I was very lucky that agent contacted me the next day. And uh, by the next week, I was represented and off and running. You know, it's very interesting because you're not a... Um, you're not an exception to the rule. Um, there have been so many people in the technology world who are geniuses, and they've dropped out of school. Now, look at Microsoft's president. I mean, we know uh, he's got to be a genius, and yet he dropped out of Harvard. So what do you, what do you account for that? Um, is it that it's too boring in school? Are they not offering you what you need to know? What well, is that, it? Well, that's a great question. The first thing I would say is I do not put myself in the same category <laughs> as some of those other uh, great you know, genies. Like, you look, Albert Einstein had uh, notoriously had trouble with school as well. Um, in my case, uh, I, I, I was kind of bored. Uh, part of the problem was that I had uh, perhaps the, the, the most phenomenal teacher of his generation in, in my father, Carl Sagan, and, uh, you know, you'd listen to him talk about the universe, or we'd talk, you know, together, and he was so incredibly uh, giving of his time, and, and he would, you know, so there's no dumb questions, and that encourages a lot of question asking. And then, you know, he would say, if he didn't know something, say, you know, I, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, that nobody knew. He'd say, you know, I don't think anybody knows that, but maybe you'll be the first person to find out. And it was such a, a, a wonderful um education just not only of, of, of the subject matter but just how to inspire people and get their their brains working mm -hmm. and so you know I, I had a lot of teachers some were, were good but a lot of them paled by comparison and I think I just got a little bored in my teenage years mm -hmm. now I had a very interesting experience many years ago um, I was uh, at that time working for CNBC and I had to do a story on lighting design of all things and I went to a hospital in the Bronx, New York, for the audience who don't know, um, because our audience is people all around the world, um, Einstein Hospital is in the Bronx, New York, and I saw in the emergency room a very special ceiling, and it had all kinds of lights, and it was your mother who gave money to that hospital. Huh. Do, you, do you know about that? Uh, that's, I, I think I know the name. You're probably talking about my stepmother, Andrianne. Who uh, is uh, behind the the most recent uh, uh, brilliant uh, version of Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson? 
hosting. Yeah, there's a uh, there's some wonderful stuff there that uh, that she's done, both uh, in terms of uh, her her professional work and uh, and her uh, philanthropy. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's probably that. I, I I know that hospital, but I, I don't know if I've actually been there myself. I see. Now let's get into your father just for a moment more. Um, when he started uh, his show, it was very innovative and very interesting, and there was a great audience for that. Now. Did what he did he ever tell you any stories something about what made him so passionate about what he did? Oh yeah, he um, <laughs> he he uh, a couple of things inspired him when he was very young. Uh, the first was the uh, 1934 World's Fair, which was just dazzling to him. His parents took him to it, and there were all these you know the, like what the what tomorrow might look like just inspired him as a boy. And that became something that really gave him a, a tremendous amount of passion. And uh, the other is, and, and as a science fiction writer, this is dear to my heart because I really believe in this reciprocal relationship between science and science fiction, where science fiction writers will imagine something and it'll inspire scientists, and scientists will create something and that'll inspire new science fiction writers. And uh, my dad was very inspired by uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Princess of Mars books, this whole series of books set on on uh, Mars, where uh, the main character one night kind of looks up at the, at the sky and sees Mars and is able to will himself there simply by wishing it. Uh-huh. You have to think of my my dad as a, as a little kid in New York trying desperately to wish himself to Mars, mm-hmm. not being able to do it. But then he said to himself, well, if I'm going to get to Mars, I'm going to have to find another way. And that way was science. I see. And actually, you know, um, rather beautifully, I find... Uh, there's actually a, a, a recording of him on Mars uh, for for future astronauts to discover. Amazing. Now, have you seen the movie The Martian? No, I hear great things about it. I have a, a three-year-old, which uh, <laughs> prevents me from going out to see a lot of movies lately. But I mm-hmm. um, heard great things about it, uh, but uh, it's rare when I get to actually get to a theater these days. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about your books. Among your credits are the acclaimed Idlewild series. You had that published in the U.S. by Penguin Books, and it's translated into several languages. Episodes of Star Trek, The Next Generation, and Star Trek Voyager is another thing that you've done. So I would like you to tell our audience all about that. <laughs> well, um, I, I started doing, a, 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 you know, writing scripts for, for uh, Hollywood first. And, uh, you know, I was uh, the first script I wrote wound up uh, um, getting optioned, which is when people are interested in making it and it didn't actually get made. But it uh, led to a writing assignment to adapt a science fiction novel, and then I brought that to Star Trek, and uh, Star Trek was really impressed and interested in having me pitch stories to them. So I I pitched a bunch of stories, and the first pitch session went uh, terribly, and I think the second one went okay, and the third one I started to understand how this works, and I was able to pitch a story um, that uh, that became a, uh, I was able to sell to them, and then um, because they liked my writing so much, they allowed me to write the teleplay, and um, that was my first episode of Star Trek called Attached, which uh, came out you know really quite well. Some you know some things went up better than others. Television is this you know beautiful medium in that it's very collaborative, and uh, sometimes that leads to amazing things, and sometimes you feel like you don't have ownership over it, and sometimes you get to contribute to things that uh, that are not yours, but you get to make a, everyone pitches in, and so it's an, it's an interesting, almost like team sports. Mm. And um, so my, my Star Trek, um, I wound up doing uh, two episodes of Next Generation, and then five episodes of Star Trek Voyager, and um very proud of, of uh, how those turned out, most of them. And uh, then I, you know, I was writing you know, all this stuff, but I, an idea was coming to me, and I didn't know whether it was a movie or a TV show or a game. Mm-hmm. And it was coming as a novel. And, uh, you know, my, my family in Ithaca said, why don't you come to Ithaca and try to give a chance to write it? And that became my first novel, Idlewild. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was very lucky again. I was able to get a literary agent to read it, and he loved it and said, where do you think the story might go from here? And I had some thoughts about it, so we sold it as a trilogy. And that became uh, the Idlewild trilogy, Idlewild Edenborn and Everfree. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, Nick, what is it about Star Trek that there are so many, I don't know whether the, this word is used, uh, Trekkies, why is that such an appealing movie, um, book, everything? Why do people love Star Trek? 
I think because it's essentially a very optimistic show. Um, there's there's a lot of very dark science fiction of which I you know I'm a tremendous fan of as well. I love dystopias. I think they're interesting object lessons for what not to do in the future. But Star Trek has this you know very inspiring, wonderful idea that we're able to put aside our differences on Earth and band together and bond with uh, other alien life forms and form the Federation and go out and have you know adventures and discover distant quadrants of the universe. It's very exciting in a way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's, you know, it reaches people on a level that a lot of darker science fiction doesn't quite touch. I see. Now, um, Star Trek it con- it continues. Um, and as you know, uh, Star Trek is in the movies as we speak. Now, are young people getting involved in becoming Trekkies too? Because is it a cult? I mean, what do you want to call <laughs> these people who just absolutely love it well it's uh i, I wouldn't call it a, a cult i would call it um you know there's a there's a certain element of it being a, a movement um, one of the things that that uh, that good science fiction can do is really you know it can address some of the bigger questions uh like the profound questions of you know we, we, who are we and where are we going and what's it all about you could answer that stuff in science fiction a little better than you can in say a, like a western and so Star Trek actually gets to some of the real meat of that. And uh, I think people often, you know, they sort of wonder what it's all about. You sort of, you know, live your life on Earth and you, you know, go to a job and sometimes it feels meaningful and sometimes it doesn't. But the, to remind us that there's something bigger, that, that we're all part of this wonderful, you know, ongoing, exciting experiment to see, you know, who we are and what it's all about and where do we come from and the origins of life and what's going to happen to the universe and it, it's anything that can kind of touch people on those levels I think can can really inspire and that's how you get a movement which is how I see the the fascination with Star Trek. Hmm. Now you've also worked on other things and one of the things that I'm very impressed by is that um, Academy Awarding actress Hilary Swank signed on to produce and star in sh- um, your new uh, is that, what, was that a book, Shrapnel Film Adaptation? Yeah, it's a graphic novel, and uh, it was incredibly uh, flattering. She's a, a wonderfully talented actress, um, but sadly, as many, you know, some projects work out and some projects uh, don't, and, and that one, that collaboration didn't quite uh, work as we might have hoped. But um, but uh, still, it's a, there's a it's an exciting project, and it was you know very flattering to to have her uh, be interested in it like that. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Nick, would you tell us our audience, especially about some part of your life that you think is very challenging and exciting, and you can share um, s- some of the stories that you think are important for our audience to know. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, like I said, I have a three-year-old uh, little girl, and uh, that's this new chapter in my life. I, I have always heard people say that, you know, you, once you, you get to this point, when you, you actually see what that's like, it's like you have this whole new octave in your emotional range where you're just looking out for the small child and seeing things through her eyes. And uh, that's what's going on with me, you know, right now. We take her to the, the local science center here in town, and uh, she gets to experience things, and you just see her light up. And it's such a, a, a moving experience as a parent. And I feel now that I'm sort of in this situation where I'm trying to give back to her the way my, my parents were able to give to me. Yeah. Now, girls generally didn't get involved, or women didn't get involved in science. Is that all changing? Oh, I mean, there's it's still a long way to go, but the, the STEM initiatives are, you know, quite good, and there are some, you know, fantastic uh, women scientists and astronauts, and uh, the, the, it's moving in the right direction. But, but yeah, it's it's there's you know there's a whole terrible history of, of sexism and trying to sort of steer the sciences away from women. Um, there's a, in fact, uh, my uh, my daughter's middle name is Hypatia. Hmm. And she's named after, you know, Hypatia of uh, Alexandria, who, was a, who kept the, the, the knowledge in the Alexandrian library. Hmm. And uh, he's a great example of, a you know, a, an early scientist and mathematician who was uh, one of the, the, the great lights of the ancient world. And, uh, you know, my, my daughter, I'm hoping, will follow in that tradition in some way, shape, or form. 
Mm-hmm. Now, Nick, you know, I should have asked you this question before, but I, I think it's important that we, uh, that you define science fiction because um, I, I know, you know, when I watch television or go to the movies and I see something that's science fiction, I, you know, I have an idea of what it's about, but tell our audience, define science fiction. It's it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question because there, it's a it's a category that uh, that often different people have different definitions of what it is and sometimes it's science fiction and sometimes people put it into categories like speculative fiction or or SF um, at its you know at its core if you look at it purely as science fiction it's, it's the question of of uh, uh, its stories um, about what's either what's going to happen next or stories that involve science in a meaningful way um there's you know there's there, there's hard science fiction which tends to be very technical and focused on exactly like for example if you were to create a warp engine that would allow you to make you know jumps between the stars what would it really that entail and then there's softer or or social science fiction which is more about you know what are human beings going to do uh, in the future and how is technology going to work with or against us Mm. And uh, a great example of a, of a social science fiction writer uh, I find is Rod Serling, who um, who also kind of uh, who was uh, in the town where I, I grew up, you know, not too far away. And you see some of the early Twilights and episodes, and they're calling out uh, their you know little towns that are sort of near where I used to live, which was hugely thrilling for me as a kid. And so uh, you know, Rod Serling is, is just sort of sort of touching the imagination. Some of it's fantasy, in mm-hmm. fairness. But anything that sort of that sort of tickles the mind about where we might be going, um, what the future is going to look like for us, is uh, is falls to the category of science fiction for me. That's the part of it that I'm most interested in. Mm. So, what's in store for you? Um, are you going to write another book? Are you going to produce a movie? Do well, what? What should I tell our audience? Or please, you tell our audience <laughs> what, what you're going to do. I'm working on a on a a, a, a novel right now. Uh, it's funny, we were just talking about uh, Twilight Zone, uh, Rod Serling. There's a very iconic episode of, of uh, the Twilight Zone where it's the, um, I don't want to give it away, but it's the it's a cookbook uh, episode where you know aliens show up and there's this book and what, is, what does the book mean? And they translate it. And as it turns out, the aliens are, you know, they're, they, they're not uh, as friendly as we once thought. And that's that's a story that's always been really interesting to me, but I've never believed the idea that aliens would come here for the purpose of eating us. It doesn't make much sense to me. Like, uh, you know, why would something that evolved on an entirely different planet have a taste for us here? And even if you did have a taste for us here, certainly you could grow us in a vat or something very similar to us without having to go through the trouble of coming here to eat us. So given that, like, uh, I never believed that motivation, but I am interested in, in, in something that comes here and would actually scare me, That's, that I would believe. So I've just started trying to imagine what that would be, and so I'm writing a, a, a dark but kind of um, off uh, off the path story of um, an alien who shows up, and uh, it's so far I'm having a lot of fun writing it. It sounds like it. Now, what would improve modern science fiction, in your opinion? Oh, that's not for me to say. I mean, it's a it's a movement that goes through a number of different uh, phases. Like, uh, there's certain points in, in time where science fiction looks like this versus looks like that. It reflects the time ultimately. So, like back when we were first thinking about uh, you know what the the internet and cyberspace, you had a whole bunch of uh, cyberpunk science fiction, less so now, and uh, there was a, a movement of, called steampunk, which was trying to imagine what the world would have been like if um, back in the, you know, the, the, the 19th century we had come up with certain advances that we didn't actually come up with. So every so often you have different kind of uh, movements, different visions of the future, and it's a wonderfully resilient, resourceful movement. You can find such great imaginings of what could be or what might have been and uh i you know i would encourage anyone to head to your you know bookstore or library and just see what's you know what's pushed out in front there's some fantastic writers out there right now right now nick why didn't most classical um science fiction foretell the globalized world of today oh well some of it i think some of it did um i mean it's it's interesting you look at the older science fiction and sometimes you can see things that look very prescient and sometimes you see things that look you know less prescient by comparison like there's uh you can find science fiction talking about uh, the the Soviet Union still existing, when of course it doesn't exist anymore. 
But uh, no, you have like interesting predictions of technology that that have come through science fiction first. Um, oh. You know, for for example, you know, Star Trek. You have the the uh, Star Trek communicators, and uh, those are, are predating the. Uh, we saw our first depictions of those before the cell phone, mm-hmm. um, but long before uh, the the iPad was something that people you know had. It was envisioned on Star Trek of the 60s. Mm-hmm. And I should also say that you know, not just technology, but the, the, the breaking of barriers. Like if you look at the, like where is the first interracial kiss in the history of television? It's Star Trek. It's yeah. Kirk and Uhura. And, uh, you know, back at a time when, uh, when Russians were, you know, always the, you know, the enemy, there's, you know, there's Chekhov and he's a Russian crew member on this very cosmopolitan crew. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of, I think, forward thinking, and sometimes it's very prescient. Sometimes it doesn't quite get it right, but it's a a really wonderful thing about science fiction that it's it's there to, to look ahead. Yeah. Does a greater understanding of hard science increase or lessen an appreciation of science fiction? My dad would say yes. I think that uh, you know, there's a certain people who who like hard hard science fiction, and particularly uh, feel like the, the the more you know, the the more you can you can delve from a story. But there's you know, there's plenty of science fiction that doesn't require you to have you know even a strong background in science, much less be a scientist yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's different points of entry for different people. You could look at you know some of the softer science fiction as a, as a potential gateway to getting into some of the the more technically uh, requiring stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been many debates um, and a lot of controversy over the fact that some people say that they see these um, kind of star uh, trek kinds of, um, oh, what shall I say, um, airplanes. What do you call them, satellites? You're talking about UFOs? UFOs. What do you think about UFOs? I um, I'm interested in knowing that because um, I've talked to a, a number of people who believe in it, and I have to admit that I'm very, very skeptical. So I'd love to know what Nick Sagan thinks about this. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm skeptical as well. I mean, it depends what you mean by a UFO. If you mean, um, hey, I saw a light in the sky, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it could have been any number of things. I mean, there's, it could have been, a, it could have been a, a, a private plane or a testing of something or a weather balloon. Certainly, if you're saying like, oh, I, aliens came down and grabbed me and put me in a ship and I went and had this adventure, <laughs> I'm a little more skeptical of that. Um, I think that uh, my, my dad said it best. He has this uh, wonderful expression that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm-hmm. And they're just, you know, while while the idea of, of uh, alien visitation is fascinating, there just isn't a lot of solid uh, evidence t- to that uh, to that point, as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people you know, really want to believe, and it's certainly like the idea that we're all alone in the universe, that that humanity is the only form of intelligent life, and all these other planets, you know, and different star systems around the universe, that there's nothing living there seems unlikely to me. So mm-hmm. I think that there is potentially life out there. We don't know till we find it, but I just don't think anyone has any evidence that there's anything that's really visited us. There's some interesting, you know, possibilities like there's a there's a, you know, SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, you know, years and years ago there was something called the wow signal, which was this strange, you know, little like a uh, a bit of, of noise mm-hmm. signal that uh, you know the scientists you know, who, who heard it wrote on his you know, wow exclamation point, and people have tried to find that again to see if there's you know any sort of way to to recreate that, and so far no one has. Was that something? Probably not. It was probably you know some sort of distortion or confusion with a terrestrial signal. But could it have been? Mm-hmm. Possibly. Okay. Now you're entitled to your opinion, and so are other people who talk about UFOs. But um, I want to sort of change the the discussion for a moment because you've mentioned um, the technology. Now, what role does technology play in science fiction, and in, of course, us going all around uh, the world uh, looking at planets? Um, do you think that uh, technology is going to f- help us find life on another planet? Well, this is the the great uh, the great question. Is you know, we, we have this you know incredible uh, um, beast of our technology that can be you know, we can do wonders for us, or it could be the the seed of our own destruction. And uh, if you're talking about uh, 
investigating the universe, you know, we've made all these, you know, really fascinating discoveries, you know, just in, in the last uh, few decades from, you know, knowing that there are, are extrasolar planets. When my dad started out as a as an astronomer, it wasn't clear about, uh, you know, whether there were there were other, you know, worlds around the stars. And if so, there probably weren't that many. And now we're finding you know, a whole plethora. There's a, there's a vast number of planets out there, including what they call uh, Goldilocks, planets in the Goldilocks zone, which means that they're, like, not too cold and not too hot, so they could theoretically be a home for life. So there's a lot of really fascinating, you know, stuff on, on, on that range and, the, you know, our, our telescopes and, and on down the line. Mm-hmm. And likewise, you know, other forms of technology from you know our, our the work we've done on the on the uh, cracking the the uh, DNA code and and like the number of medicines that are going to come from that and our, our work in nanotechnology, it's a lot of very exciting stuff. But there's also you know this very worrisome trend that we have as humans where we basically create more and more powerful weapons with our technology, mm-hmm. and we we don't make weapons that we don't use. We tend to use them. Right. And so there's a real danger that we're going to create something that's you know even more dangerous to us than uh, than nuclear weapons, whether mm-hmm. it's germ warfare or you know very gray goo, which turns everything into this you know other terrible kind of uh, biomass. There's all kinds of stuff we could do that could destroy ourselves and. It's uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, Stephen Hawking believes that within the next hundred years we should really form a colony somewhere off-world, so that if the worst befalls us and we do something that destroys the entire Earth, at least all our eggs are not in that one basket. Right. But having said that, like, there's nowhere we can go to that's going to be as good for us as Earth, and it's very worrisome that people treat it almost as if it's a disposable place because. You can't find another place like we evolved here. It's specifically for us, mm-hmm. and uh, we have to treat it with uh, with respect and cherish it. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I Nick, I want to uh, sort of switch our seats around. I want to put you in the host's seat, and I want to know if you were the host of my show, what question would you ask the guest? And the reason I'm asking that is because you know more than Anybody that's listening to uh, the show right now uh, about science fiction. So if I were to ask you again to p- make a question for yourself, what w- question would you ask? Oh, <laughs> I don't know that anyone's ever challenged me in quite that way. Um, well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't honestly know what if I can say in terms of uh, science fiction, but let me, let me tell you uh, something that, that's... Uh, that's uh, kind of inspiring to me, and that, that uh, I, you know, I teach uh, writing in addition to uh, the creative work that I'm doing. I teach screenwriting, mm-hmm. both at uh, Ithaca College and Syracuse University, and uh, you know, we talk about uh, screenwriting mostly, so it's your character and plot and dialogue and the history of it and all that. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that we've we've been uh, talking about is the uh, the neuroscience of storytelling. And is able to get into um, just as fascinating to me, like why your brain uh, likes stories. And I got into you get into the science of it, and like so, I, I was talking to the class about how you know we're just having a conversation, like like you and I are right now. Mm-hmm. How there are a couple of language centers of the brain that activate Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and that's what you get your information. It's processing it. But if I tell you a story. Um, a narrative will activate many other parts of the brain. And, you know, it's all the sort of interesting stuff of language where if I talk about, uh, you know, different smells, if I say, you know, cinnamon or lavender, that'll work on the olfactory cortex of your brain. If I talk about throwing a ball with my daughter, Mm -hmm. it'll work on the motor cortex that controls arms. And so your brain is actually, like, it, it actually, when you hear a story, it starts to put itself in the position of, uh, of, of, of the subject of that story. It's actually anticipating it and feeling it. And it's why, you know, if you say something, like if I tell you a, a gory story and you might wince, like you're wincing because you're sort of feeling that on a level. Your brain is designed to feel that, mm-hmm. which is fascinating in terms of why. And, and likewise, like in the same way that your, your olfactory cortex can work from lavender cinnamon, if I say that like the uh, a stench of corruption follows a politician. Mm-hmm. Like, it works that way, too. Like, just a metaphor like that will activate a different part of your brain. And so it allows you, as a storyteller, to to really, uh, you know, get to people at a level that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get 
just by talking to them. Mm -hmm. So if you have a conversation and they say, oh, we should take care of the planet, you'll say, yeah, I, I agree, or you know, maybe you disagree. But if I tell you a story about the preciousness of the planet, it sneaks up on you in a different way, and you feel it the way the protagonist feels it. Like There's something very beautiful about that ability to reach people. And uh, I'm very proud of, of being a part of the storytelling uh, process with that. Wow. Now, so the brain um, operates in mysterious ways. And um, I know that neuroscience is a very, very popular topic uh, because it deals with things like depression, anxiety, various other things. And now you're telling me that it also controls... Uh, what we think about space, what we think about science fiction, what we think about what we read. Now, th do you talk a little bit about neuroscience in your courses? Yeah, I, I just a little bit, just to the extent, the extent of the storytelling. But uh, but neuroscience is, is really it's fascinating in and of itself, and it's it's really uh, potentially the, the future. I mean. Put it this way, like they, they say that by the end of the century, we may be able to have mapped the entire human brain. And, you know, as you know, our computers are getting more and more powerful and smaller. Yes. And so you can get to the point, theoretically, I mean, it's, it gets talked about in science fiction, but it's, it really is something that could be achieved, where you could find a way to mirror the human brain through technology. Hmm. That allows you to, to, like, do any number of amazing things, including potentially to cheat death. You could take your brain and, and save it. You could, you know, at this, you could, you know, finish the show and go and like have your brain uploaded to a computer. Hmm. And if something ever happened to you, you know, you could then have that saved brain state downloaded it back into a new body. And you know, this is just seems like far out, you know, crazy stuff. But within the next, you know, hundred or two hundred years, it's it's entirely possible. And then you know, you could theoretically have the secret of immortality through that. Wow. So just listening to you and your passion and your interest in so many different things makes me realize that um, Nick Sagan is the kind of guy who um, ought to um, share a lot of stuff with our audience. And um, I know that one of the ways that you can do that is through your books. So I want you to tell our audience again, uh, what are the books and how do they find you? And sure. um uh, and anything else you want to say? No, that's very nice. Well, my the first novel is called Idlewild, and then the Edenborn and Everfree, and it's science fiction, and it's a little bit about uh, um, genetic engineering and uh, suspended animation, and and uh, it really I should say that the first book came out of my feelings of being what it felt like to me to be a teenager and trying to figure out the world and feel like you were learning things, but not everyone was telling you the, the truth, and then. Out of that came a mystery. I was able to distort that into an interesting story, and, and that became the, the trilogy. Uh, if people want to follow me, I'm uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Nick Sagan, and uh, my website is nicksagan.com. Well, thank you, Nick Sagan, for being on the Susan Brender Show. You've been an enlightenment, and I'm sure that um, we should do something again because um, you are a great guest. So thank oh. you again. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. 